inventing countermeasures to defend against the cyber attacks you invented in attack service, the novel. I'm Tanya Hall and joining me is Corey Doctorow, author, technology activist, journalist, and special advisor to the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Welcome back, Corey. Thank you very much. What a treat to be back on. Always great to have you. Give us a brief summary, our, our audience, for some reason they don't know who you are. Uh, give us a brief summary of your background, maybe your writing, and what you've done over the last few years. Sure. Well, I'm a, a novelist and a, an activist. I, I've worked with various uh, nonprofits for about two decades now, primarily the Electronic Frontier Foundation, which is a San Francisco based nonprofit working on human rights in the digital realm. And that's really where my work all intersects. I, I think that there are a lot of people who worry about what technology does uh, and a lot of people who worry about who technology is doing it to. But I like to think that what I bring to the party is, is combining those two, that, that understanding that what technology does, who it does it for and who it does it to have to all be considered together, that it's, it's not enough to ask those questions on their own. And sometimes I make those interventions, you know, in policy forums where I'll, I'll, I was a delegate to the United Nations for many years and worked in Brussels and have been in DC and Ottawa and Westminster. And sometimes I'll make it through novels and sometimes I'll make it through essays and speeches. Your latest book, Attack Surface, just at the shelves, it's the third book in your Little Brother series. Explain the concept behind the series. Sure. Well, the first two books, Little Brother and Homeland, were young adult books uh, about kids, mostly in San Francisco, who resisted the creeping authoritarianism that uh, occurred after a terrorist attack on their city, a fictional terrorist attack that resulted in the DHS swooping in and turning San Francisco into a police state. And they do all this kind of techno thriller hijinks like um, using uh, hacked Xboxes to build a cryptographically secured network that America's spies can't penetrate to build a guerrilla army and coordinate tactics that results in the Bill of Rights being restored to the people of San Francisco and California. Um, those books really inspired a, a generation. I have met, at, I would say hundreds at this point of human rights workers, technologists, cryptographers, security researchers, uh, lawyers and activists who said that reading those books on the one hand made them very excited about the possibility of technology as a liberating force, but also very frightened about technology as a controlling and manipulating force. And that they saw the urgency, not just of resisting technology, but of steering it, of steering it towards the project of, of human thriving instead of you know, corporate or, or state power. And this third book, uh, Attack Surface is a standalone novel for adults, and it tells a, a different kind of story. It, it uses a, a different protagonist, a woman named Masha Maximov, who in the first two books we meet as a surveillance contractor, someone working on the other side. And by the time we meet her in this book, she's gone full on cyber mercenary. Her job is helping former Soviet dictators crush post uh, uh, democratic uh, uprisings using surveillance tech. And she has a kind of comeuppance when she discovers that her childhood best friend back in San Francisco is being targeted with the same cyber weapons that she spent her career developing because her former best friend or her childhood best friend is now an activist in a, in a movement for black lives group. Uh, and um, she has to reckon with all of the rationalization she's made in her career. And she ends up back in San Francisco trying to figure out what it means to be an ally as a technologist to movements for liberation and, and what the limits are of just telling people what they should do as opposed to meeting them where they are. And it's a book that I hope addresses another kind of technologist, not just the technologist who gets excited about the liberatory power and is worried about the, the power to control, but instead someone who has talked themselves into a position where in exchange for massages on Wednesdays and free kombucha at a big tech company, spends their whole life taking away the power of technology that made them excited about the field in the first place and to show them what a path to redemption looks like. And, you know, in a, in a moment in which tens of thousands of Googlers walked off the job to protest uh, the company's involvement in the U.S. drone program and its complicity in Chinese surveillance and where you see the tech won't build it movement at Facebook and at Salesforce and Microsoft and Amazon talking about resisting facial recognition and work with ICE, I feel like this is a very timely story to be telling. So 
Is it true that you write um, a large segment of yourself into at least one character of each of your works of fiction? Well, I, I think that there is this sense in which all fiction is science fiction because all fiction has the pretense that you can know what any other person was feeling or thinking, which is not a thing that any human being in the history of our species has ever done, right? The only person whose thoughts you've ever been privy to are your own. And so all books necessarily include their author as the kind of backstop for every character because it's the only frame of reference you will ever have is, is your own lived experience. And certainly there's a great deal of, of both aspiration and, and self-criticism in the way that I handle the characters in these books, but they're a lot cooler and more competent than I'll ever be. I mean, one of the things that I'm, I, I stick to in these books that I think is distinctive about them is I try to make the technology as robust and realistic as possible. There's this weird trend in 2020 even for writers who write techno thrillers to pretend that their audiences don't know how computers work, that they don't spend all day with computers. And it's like if in a Western, you suddenly decided that it would be of like narrative convenience for the horses to be able to fly, or, or maybe that old Western gambit of having the six guns fire 20 rounds before anyone needs to reload. And I feel like there's so much interesting stuff in the capabilities and constraints of computers that writing stories that lean on those instead of ignoring them makes for stories that are very uh, exciting and interesting and enduring because those characteristics of computers, they last, right? Although we make a lot of advances in computer engineering, computer science is pretty static. We're not anywhere near inventing, say, a cryptographic cipher that works when good guys use it, but doesn't work when bad guys use it, despite the fact that governments have been demanding this since the 90s. And, and so by hewing to that stuff, I'm able to tell stories that are both of the moment and that live beyond the moment. But the ability to build those technologies or reverse engineer them, that's beyond me. I was never a great programmer and I haven't worked as a programmer and now getting on to three decades. So, it, you know, it's, it's, it's clearly aspirational <laughs> more than bibli uh, uh, autobiographical. So on the topic you mentioned before, how serious is the problem of real state-sponsored cyber attacks on their own citizens and journalists? I think that there's, there's two areas where this is really significant. So the first is the actual attacks, right? And we've seen a lot of state-sponsored attacks on their own citizens around the world. Very famously, uh, uh, a European Israeli company called the NSO Group was involved in the Saudi government's use of a, a tool called Pegasus to entrap the journalist Jamal Khashoggi, who was lured to a Saudi embassy and then murdered and dismembered. Um, and so there's certainly a lot of that around the world. And, and that is um, an increasing risk. I mean, you see this in China, you see it in the US during the uh, Black Lives Matter uprising of the summer where we had predator drones and cyber weapons that gather data from mobile phones and other devices being deployed without any transparency, without any obvious constitutional or lawful basis and, and seemingly without limit. But that I think is only the first order effect. What's really worrying is that governments have decided that their uh, prolonged existence demands that they be able to pierce digital security at will. And so they have both sabotaged digital security. We saw, for example, that the National Institute of Standards and Technology uh, sabotaged cryptographic standards to make them deliberately weaker. That was something in the Snowden revelations. And also they have discovered defects that companies inadvertently put in their technology and kept them secret, hoarded those defects so that they could weaponize them against their adversaries. And the problem with that is that these technologies are widely used and depended on by, by all of us in so many ways. And a vulnerability that a government introduces or leaves to fester is a vulnerability that a criminal or another government will eventually discover and weaponize against the people that our own government is trying to protect. And a really good example of that are the leaked CIA and NSA cyber weapons that were weaponized by not very bright cyber criminals to turn into ransomware that have then gone on to shut down cities, hospitals, schools, uh, electoral officials on the eve of, of critical elections. 
uh, with, with consequences that really can't be overstated. And that decision, I think, is even more consequential. You know, it's it, attacking the people who live in your country is a matter of democratic fundamentals and something that we resolve, I think, through better, more accountable governments that uh, are, are reined in with, by constitutional constraints. But the decision to do that, any program of attacking your own citizens through cyber weaponry is also a deliberate weakening of the security of every single person in the world who relies on the technology that you aim to use for those attacks. And what we keep learning is that, especially in this monopolized time, where you know four or five companies dominate all of our technology, that if you discover a defect in a flagship tool from Google or Apple or Microsoft, it can be used to attack millions, hundreds of millions of people and enterprises and agencies and charities, and that the people who wield those weapons are completely indiscriminate, right? The, the, the you know, ransomware is a, uh, an attack of opportunity. Very often the ransomware attackers who uh, crash whole hospitals, which is a thing that was happening even at the height of the pandemic, they don't even know that they've seized a hospital. They just have these self-replicating worms that are taking over any enterprise they can and issuing ransom demands. And so that indiscriminacy, right, the, the, the creation of super weapons that land in the hands of dum-dums is, I think, a far scarier thing than even the totalitarian risk of states being able to attack their populations. You don't always follow traditional processes of distributing your work. What's the most nerve-wracking part of writing and releasing a completed piece of your intellectual property? <laughs> well, in 2020, it was quite a year for it. I, I published four books in 2020, uh, not just Attack Surface, but, you know, my publisher, Tor McMillan, reissued Little Brother and Homeland in a new edition with an introduction by Ed Snowden. And then McMillan, another imprint of theirs for a second, also published my first picture book, Posey the Monster Slayer. And then on top of that, um, Medium, uh, through their one zero imprint, published a, a long pamphlet or short book of mine online called How to Destroy Surveillance Capitalism. And, you know, the pandemic and the election have been really troubling for the fortunes of authors. Um, so much of our fortunes rely on hand selling by booksellers. Uh, you know, we know that Amazon is something like 41% of, of uh, hardcover book sales or, or print book sales, but that means that more than half is taking place in, in bookstores. And so much of that is reliant on the relationship between booksellers and the 20% of readers who buy 80% of the books. And as a recovering bookseller, I'm very aware of this. And bookstores were just clobbered by the crisis. And, you know, the publishers did their best. A lot of them extended further credit to help the store stay alive and so on. But it's not been a good time. And so that's especially nerve wracking. Um, likewise, you know, the importance of finding the people who are sort of your true fans and seeing them every couple of years when you go out on tour. I was meant to be in Canada, the US, uh, the UK and India uh, this month and next. And all of those trips are obviously canceled. I was also supposed to be in Germany over the Christmas break. That is also canceled. And uh, all of those tours, all of those opportunities to meet with reporters, to meet with booksellers, to meet with fans, to do institutional visits, to research groups, to companies, to universities, to community groups. All of that stuff is canceled. And I'm picking up a lot of it through these digital meetings, but they're not quite the same. I mean, I'm, I'm in the middle of a digital book tour right now where we've done eight spectacular events with eight booksellers with uh, eight sets of guests. So tonight is the last one as we record this on Thursday. And, uh, they've been great to do. I mean, really great. They've been better than any other video event I've done since the crisis hit. But also the joke I tell at the beginning of everyone is, you know, we're going to finish up at the, at the top of the hour here because we know that you've got so many other Zoom events that you want to get on because if there's one thing I love at the end of a day of, of hard work, it's to unwind in the evening with a bunch of Zoom conferences. Said nobody ever, right? And so the best tool that we have for, for reaching audiences while we're all locked indoors is a tool 
that relies on people overcoming their absolutely understandable and universal exhaustion with the use of that tool. So all of that has been hard. And then add to that the monopolization of the, of the digital channels. Um, you know, uh, Amazon and Apple won't actually carry my audiobooks at all because they're DRM free and both of them have a requirement that you sell audiobooks in a proprietary format that's locked forever to their platforms and that's a felony with a five year prison sentence to unlock. Uh, you know, that's, that's also been really hard and I ended up doing something that worked very well to get around it with this book. I, I ran a Kickstarter to pre-sell an independently produced version of that audiobook that raised two hundred and seventy thousand dollars, but you know, as exciting as that was, it was also extremely harrowing and nerve-wracking because it 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 might not have worked, and it was an enormous amount of work to to make happen. But it did work, and it was a huge success. So congratulations yeah. on that. Thank so you. I know you have more video conferences shortly. So so I'm going to make this the last question. What's the single best countermeasure? a person can employ to protect themselves against a committed cyber warrior? Boy, I have to say that um, that's one of those questions that I wanna, I wanna answer by reframing it. Because I think that this is an area where as an individual, it's, there's not much you can do. Uh, as the, the book attack surface makes the point, to defend, you have to make no mistakes. To attack, you have to discover one mistake that the defender has made and exploit it to get through their defenses. And so defense is always going to be hard. What we need rather than individual action to solve these big systemic problems is systemic action. In the same way that like no amount of recycling will solve climate change, uh, no amount of individual operational security will prevent an advanced persistent threat from gaining access to your data and you because eventually you'll slip up, eventually you'll make a mistake. What we need instead are systemic answers. So for example, we need a, a national cyber defense strategy that is oriented around defense. Right now, the orientation towards offense, towards being able to attack the state's adversaries means that in addition to whatever problems that defenders normally have, we are all hampered by the fact that the state is creating and leaving new vulnerabilities in our technology that we don't know about, that they incorrectly believe no one else will discover. They actually, there's a name for this doctrine within the intelligence community. It's called NOBUS, which stands for no one but us is smart enough to discover this problem. This is not true, right? And so we are very much hampered by this. And when it comes to domestic surveillance, the best answer that we have is not better cryptography, although that's important, it's better governments. It's more responsive, more uh, legitimate states. And we are in the midst of an election. And this is a moment in which uh, we have the rare opportunity to directly intervene in the functioning of our state. Uh, as a Canadian living in the US, I don't get a vote. So the closest I can come is exhort you to register and vote. Uh, you know, there's a, a term in, in security circles called rubber hose cryptanalysis. So cryptanalysis is when a cryptographer tries to break your cryptography by doing math, right? By figuring out what, what problems there were in your programming. But rubber hose cryptanalysis is a lot simpler. Uh, they tie you to a chair and hit you with a rubber hose until you tell them what the passphrase is. And key lengths or improved software auditing do not fix rubber hose cryptanalysis. We have exactly one countermeasure for rubber hose cryptanalysis. It's legitimate states. And so the role, I think, properly speaking, of personal security tools is to, on the one hand, prevent untargeted attacks, to, on the second, in the second instance, slow down the uh, targeted attacks, and finally, to use that slowing down of targeted attacks to give us the space in which we can build and foment political change that will demand that our state be just, responsive, and legitimate, and, and that it act in concert with us in consultation with us and with our personal best interests at heart. And anything less is at best a temporary measure. Corey Doctorow, technology activist, journalist, and special advisor to the Electronic Frontier Foundation. And last but not least, author of his latest work, Attack Surface. 
if somebody wants to connect with you, Corey, maybe they want to get a copy of any of your books, how can they do that? Well, first, let me say where you can go if you want to get involved in the fight for a more just digital world, and that's EFF.org, the Electronic Frontier Foundation's website. As to me, I maintain a kind of uh, cross-platform presence at Pluralistic.net, and Pluralistic.net is where you'll find how to read long-form work I post to Twitter as threads every day, or get them as newsletters, or through RSS, uh, all without any surveillance tracking or metrics. Uh, pluralistic.net. Sounds great. Thanks again for your time, Corey, and best of luck with your tour. Thank you. All right. And find more of my interviews right here or at tanyahall.net. Thanks for watching.